All right, well, here we are, our Stress Buster series. We're already at lesson number seven. Uh, and the title of this lesson is Stress from Loss, Part Two. Stress from Loss, Part Two. Last time we uh, talked about the stress that is uh, caused by loss and basically the relationship between stress and loss is that loss, any kind of loss produces grieving and grieving is stressful. So there's the connection. Uh, I mentioned several things about grieving, just a little review here. First of all, it's a process that has identifiable stages. We talked about the five stages, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Also, we said that uh, grieving was necessary for recovery. Uh, grieving is the body's uh, way uh, to cope with loss. Uh, and each stage in the process of grieving had a purpose. Another thing we talked about, um, everybody grieves, whether they're conscious of it or not. And uh, we're not quite ready for the experience uh, when it comes. A fourth thing, uh, grieving produces stress and a way to lower stress was to understand the process because most of the stress in the grieving process is caused by the fact that many do not understand what's happening. When you don't understand what's happening to you, when you don't understand why one day you're angry and next day you're depressed, then another, you know, two days later you feel you've kind of got a, a handle on the situation, then you're, you're angry again. You, when you don't understand that you're going through this particular process, uh, that creates a lot of stress. So one of the ideas uh, in the grieving process to lower the stress is to understand about the process of grieving. All right, so in this lesson, we're gonna look at how other people react to us as we grieve, and we're gonna study a biblical strategy for grief recovery. Now, usually the first stage of grief is denial. We, uh, we don't want to believe that what is happening has actually happened to us. You know, we refuse to face the facts. How many people say, I just can't believe that he's dead, or I can't believe that she's gone, or uh, uh, you know, people who have uh, lost a certain mobility, uh, uh, the ability you know, to walk or to see or to do something. Uh, have a hard time letting go of the idea that they can still do everything that they used to do, uh, but in reality they can't. Um, uh, sometimes uh, uh, we avoid the subject, you know, denial by neglect. We don't want to talk about it, you know, or we put off grief through activity. Uh, we overdo work or hobbies, or we abuse things like uh, food or drugs or too much TV, too many video games. I remember one of the ladies here that many of us knew in, uh, in our congregation, her name was Bernice, and a wonderful lady, and uh, her husband died. And uh, her husband died, and we had the funeral, and not just not a few weeks after her husband died, she started writing poetry. She wanted to put poetry. She wanted to you know, put her poems uh, in the uh, bulletin. Uh, she uh, learned how to play the guitar and wanted to uh, perform uh, some of the songs that she had uh, written. She got built, uh, busy doing quilts. Uh, you know, she was just all over the place. And then finally she crashed and uh, fell into a, quite a deep uh, depression uh, and couldn't understand why. And even many of her family members couldn't understand why this had uh, happened. Well, she had put off the grieving process through busyness. She got busy writing songs, playing the guitar, traveling, doing all kinds of things, doing anything except facing the reality uh, that she had to go through uh, this uh, process. So it's important to, to, to get beyond denial because uh, we can't heal until we do so. Now, sometimes our family and our friends who are witness to our loss go into denial themselves. They're affected uh, by the grieving process. You know, a, a person's pain is minimized by others in order to kind of rush them 
through the grieving process and thus denying its uh, legitimacy. The idea is uh, if they get better faster, then you know, this thing that happened is not really that bad. You know, at, other time, at other times, excuse me, uh, the pain is explained away by using platitudes or rationalizations that serve only to protect the helper from dealing with the unpredictability and the difficulty of life and offers no real comfort to the one who is grieving. In other words, helpers say phrases to make the other person feel good. You know, they think. They say things like, well, you know, you gotta start thinking positively or uh, whatever you do, don't let yourself go. Or uh, think of the children, you know, stop being depressed or stop grieving, you know, think of the children or grow up or cowboy up or toughen up or man up or my personal favorite, you know what, it's better this way. All, all things to try to move the person out of the grieving process as quickly as possible. You know, the book of Job in the Bible provides a wonderful illustration of this kind of ineffective consolation given by friends, uh, especially in Job chapter eight. I think we're pretty familiar with the story of Job. Job has lost everything, right? He lost his family, his money, his health, his home, his wife, and then his friends come to console him as he sits in dust and ashes, covered with uh, uh, painful sores all over his body. And at first they sit quietly with him, but then they begin to speak to him. One of his friends named Bildad begins to talk to him about his, meaning Job's attitude because Job had been lamenting and crying out to God for an explanation of the things that had happened to him. And so we read in Job chapter eight, beginning in verse one, it says, then Bildad the Shuhite answered, how long will you say these things and the words of your mouth be a mighty wind? Does God pervert justice or does the almighty pervert what is right? If your sons sinned against him, then he delivered them into the power of their transgression. If you would seek God and implore the compassion of the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, surely now he would rouse himself for you and restore your righteous estate. Though your beginning was insignificant, yet your end will increase greatly. Please inquire of past generations and consider the things searched out by their fathers. For we are only of yesterday and know nothing because our days on earth are as a shadow. Will they not teach you and tell you and bring forth words from their minds? So here Bildad, he's concerned that Job's questioning shows a lack of respect for God's justice. So he kind of leaps to God's defense here. Bildad thought, as was the thinking of that era, that God visited immediate justice or blessing on people. If you were rich and had a lot of blessings, well, it meant that you were a righteous person. However, if you were ill or if there were tragedies in your life, well, it meant that there was sinfulness in your life and you were being punished for this sinfulness. So what does he do? He tells Job to sort of own up to what he's done wrong and everything will be okay. His theory is nice and neat, and it enables him to avoid emotional entanglement with Job. Uh, he just points out Job's mistakes, and in doing so thinks that everything will be fine. Job doesn't buy it, even though he used to believe in the same theory, but he doesn't buy it because he's done his best to serve God, and yet, he's still suffering. In other words, Job himself knows that he is a righteous man. He's not done anything to offend God and yet he's being punished and he is suffering. So there's something you know, that's, that's not right here. So this story highlights some ineffective methods that friends and family have 
of avoiding the grieving process themselves when loss occurs close to home. In other words, they don't like to see somebody else grieving because it means that they also will be drawn into the process. So there are ways that we can help grieving people that will assist them in their time of need and also help reduce the stress that comes from the process. For example, offer physical affection a hug, an arm around the shoulder, the holding of someone's hand. In other words, uh, communicate caring without words. This is very helpful. It doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't answer any questions. It simply demonstrates affection for the individual at a time when they need human affection and human caring. Uh, another uh, thing that helpers can do, uh, they can say, if you need to just talk, then call me. In other words, you can be available and you can repeat and present the opportunity uh, to show sincerity over and over again. When your friend who is grieving knows that you're available just to listen to them, not, not available to tell them what to do, just available to sit with them and, and, and help them uh, bear the burden uh, that they carry because of their grief. This is helpful. This reduces stress. Um, offer a specific service. Uh, 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 you know, uh, let me bring dinner to your house on Wednesday night or Thursday night, which would be a convenient night for you. Or uh, I noticed that uh, you know, the grass is getting a little long and I'm sure you, you, you don't have time or I'm sure you're certainly not in the mood to do yard work. Why don't I come over on Saturday and just take care of that for you? Offer a specific service. Why? Because it's helpful. Again, does it answer the question why? Does it take away the grief? Does it bring back the person who was, no. But it does lift some of the burden of everyday life from that individual and consequently lowers the stress. It's stressful, you know, to see uh, your property, uh, you know, going to pot uh, and not just not feeling like getting out there and mowing and clipping and edging and doing what you know, normally used to do to keep everything ship shape. Another thing that you can do to help you can express your concern. You can express your love with words of encouragement to help the individual during this time of difficulty. You can help them by giving them, uh, you know, a sympathetic ear. Uh, you can repeat to them that uh, you're trying to understand how difficult it must be uh, going through what they're going through. Uh, this comes across as a, a concern. It comes across as, you know, my friend uh, uh, cares about uh, what has happened to me. Um, you can share your own feelings. Uh, you can share some of your own feelings and experiences in similar circumstances. Uh, when someone loses a loved one, uh, I can relate to that person because I've lost loved ones, maybe not in the same way. Maybe I didn't have the same relationship with the person that I love, that, that they had, but there's some similarities uh, that take place when you lose a dad or a mom or a sister or a brother or a spouse. And sometimes you're able to say, I know how you feel in losing your spouse of many years because I lost my spouse of many years and I sympathize with you. That's very comforting to the other individual. Again, you're not explaining why, you're not thinking that this is going to solve all the problems, but there's something very comforting in the idea that a friend, a person, uh, really understands 
uh, the pain that you are experiencing because they also shared this type of pain. You can also include the grieving person uh, in your everyday life, an invitation to dinner, uh, perhaps let's just go watch a ball game, uh, something ordinary to do, uh, just to change, you know, the di to change the dynamic. A lot of times uh, people, especially people who have lost a marriage partner, not through death, but through divorce, uh, find themselves very lonely. Before when they were uh, married, uh, there would be invitations to dinner uh, uh, and vice versa. You know, we go to your house, you guys come to our house, you know. And then after the divorce, uh, even if the individual is there, is, you know, has been the one who has been abandoned, for some reason or other, they, they no longer fit socially uh, with their friends anymore. They're not a couple. And so they don't get invited uh, to play cards or they don't get invited to just, you know, to go to the barbecue anymore. And so including the grieving person and for whatever reason they're grieving, including them in simple things of life uh, is very comforting. And it helps them take a step towards having a normal life again. And as I mentioned before, goes a long way in lowering the stress caused by significant, or the loss of someone significant in their life. And of course, offer spiritual help, offer to pray. And make sure when you say, I'm going to pray for you, make sure you follow through on that. I mean, even if you don't follow through on that exactly at that moment, make sure that you know, when you go home at some time or another, that you follow through on the promise to pray for that person, or perhaps to study the Bible with them, or maybe help them to make it to church and, and, and help them not to fall into the habit of not coming to church. Of course, you understand why a person may not feel like you know, coming to church to, to, to worship if you wish immediately after a significant loss of some kind. I can understand that. But there comes a time when that individual has to kind of begin to live again, uh, has to kind of you know, begin to uh, put their life back together. And part of life, especially of a believer, is uh, worship and offering to help that individual get that part of their lives going again is a great service uh, and, and helps lower the pain and the stress. Of, uh, of the grieving process. So these are some of the things that a person can do to support the one who is grieving. Now, here are some other things that you can't do. So we started with you know, seven things that you can do, offer physical affection, be available, offer specific service, express your concern, share your feelings, include the person in your life, offer spiritual help, all these and more, there are things that you can do. Now here are some of the things you can't do. Number one, you can't grieve for them. They're the ones that have to experience it for themselves. Don't, don't wish that you can do the suffering for them. It's a noble idea when people say, oh, I wish I could just take that burden and you know, put it onto myself. Well, that, that is a noble idea, but it's not a good idea. You can't grieve for them. Remember, grieving is a process that helps the individual heal. You, you can't answer the question, why? You don't have to give them the answer to that question. Only God knows, and many times he doesn't answer the question, why? And it's quite all right if the person said to you, why, why did this happen to her? Why did it happen to me? It's okay to say, I don't know why. Let's pray about that. But so many people you know, are fixers 
And so they, they want to be able to answer why, and they make up these stories, they make up these scenarios to somehow explain the why. And many of those scenarios are more hurtful than helpful. So you can't answer why. Number three, you cannot speed things up. We don't have the power to make the grieving process move faster. And if you try, you simply put more pressure and stress on the individual. In other words, they feel that they have to start feeling better and being happy and normal again uh, in order to please you because you're expecting this of them and you're kind of pressuring them. Come on, you can do it, you know, pick yourself up, let's go. And if you don't live up to you know, their expectations, uh, that makes you feel bad. In other words, it adds more pressure, it adds more stress when you're being pushed to feel better faster. And of course, you cannot fix everything. Some people are natural born fixers. When something happens to someone, uh, to someone else, instead of uh, helping the other person to arrive at acceptance, they try to fix everything. They try to fix broken marriages, lost dreams, you know, whatever it is, they, they've got an answer, they've got to fix it. But you know, sometimes there are some things that can't be fixed and part of acceptance is realizing that. Acceptance isn't just, you know, hey, uh, I accept, I accept that this is, uh, this is the way things are gonna be. Acceptance many times is realizing that, you know what, that marriage is not gonna get fixed or that person is not coming back or that ability that I used to have, I don't have anymore and it doesn't matter what I do, I'm, I'm not going to get that ability back. So a strategy for renewal, especially for Christians who experience overstress uh, for, uh, from grieving and loss is a strategy for new hope. You know, much of the grieving process is designed to help us deal with the past and, and help us to adjust to the present. Loss, however, affects the future also and much of the stress caused by loss comes from the anxiety over what will happen to us in the future. Now in the secular world, the answer to this anxiety is usually said to be within oneself. You know, believe in yourself. You know, sports heroes, you hear them say that. Uh, you have to believe in yourself uh, or you have to become a, a new person, you know, become the new you. And usually that means some uh, new exercise uh, regimen. Or you have to find a new person. You know, I, I got to get out there. Uh, people think the way to end grieving is by dating again. Uh, to, an, to a certain extent that might be true, but that's not how you end grieving. These are fine things, but they assume that there resides within ourselves or in others, all of the resources that we need to renew ourselves after the pain of loss. As Christians, of course, we have similar experiences and emotions as others do, but our perspective on these is different as is our strategy on how to find renewal. In order to find new hope and renewal after loss, we can follow the example of the apostles after their loss of Jesus. They, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, they had a great love and fellowship with Jesus. It was deep, it was sincere, it was abiding. The apostles had great hopes and expectations for themselves and their faith and their people all tied to Jesus. But then when Jesus was taken and killed, they lost not only a friend, but they lost a leader. They lost self-esteem and faith because of their own cowardice. 
And also they lost hope for the great kingdom that they were about to build. After his resurrection, Jesus uh, 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 sent them to wait for him in Jerusalem. And while there, the process of renewal was taking place in the following ways. First, they were together. Luke says that they were gathered with others in the other room. We read in Acts uh, chapter one, verses uh, 12 and 13. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Barth Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. And so they were all together in the upper room. Uh, grieving is not necessarily a solitary action. We need a fellowship, not only to help us during the grieving process, but it is through our interaction with other Christians that our faith is strengthened and our desire to carry on is encouraged. We don't realize how much we love and need the brethren until we grieve because many times it's the brethren who carry us until we can walk by ourselves again. Another thing that the apostles did, they devoted themselves to prayer. We read about that in verse 14. It says, these all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. Prayer doesn't change the past, but it does shape the future. Loss brings change and change brings decisions and making decisions is stressful, especially when they have to be made in the difficult circumstances of a death or a divorce or a serious uh, illness. James uh, tells us, um, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Note, he says that God doesn't give the answer, nor does he make the decision. God gives us the wisdom that we need to make the best decision in the light of his word and the circumstances that we are in. So most of the times, it isn't about right or wrong, but what's best. And when we're grieving, God helps us to see more clearly our options. This clearer vision comes through long and thoughtful prayer time with our Lord. And then the apostles took action. We read in verses 15 to 26, it says, at this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering of about 120 persons was there together and said, brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his intestines gushed out and it became known to all who were living in Jerusalem, so that in their own language, that field was called Hakeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate, and let no one dwell in it, and let another man take his office. Therefore, it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning uh, with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they put forward two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots for them and the lot fell to Matthias. And he was added to the 11 apostles. 
you know, often um, uh, the uh, conflict of the saints and, and prayer, um, uh, Peter uh, found the courage to stand and to take action. Uh, they were praying, they were trying to uh, comfort, I said conflict, but I meant comfort. They were trying to comfort each other, but at some point they had to move forward. Now they hadn't received the spirit yet. I mean, the power of the spirit. They hadn't preached the gospel yet, but they did what was necessary and at hand. They filled the vacant space left by Judas in preparation for their great mission. You know, the longest journey always begins with the first step. So the new life, the new hope, uh, the renewal, if you wish, has to begin somewhere or somehow. And it's usually with one small action, whether it is packing up all the old stuff or uh, uh, writing away for information or throwing away what you're not going to use anymore. Many times we want renewal in one instant, but usually it begins with a series of small actions that, one, uh, uh, in, uh, that, that are in the direction of the new goal. You know, we love to be here and then just close our eyes and open our eyes and, and we're there, but that's not how it works. The way that it works is that in our grieving process, as we're working it through, we make some small decisions, some very small decisions, but slowly and very surely, the decisions begin to formulate a direction. And pretty soon we see ourselves moving in a particular direction that God has given us, but he's given it to us one small step at a time. And so with the help of the brethren and prayer for wisdom, we can usually find a step that's small enough to handle, but in the right direction that will take us to a new hope and a new life. And so loss creates stress, but we can reduce the stress created by that loss if we first of all understand the natural grieving cycle that accompanies all loss great and small. And secondly, if we use a biblical strategy for our renewal, and that is fellowship with other saints, prayer to God and action guided by God's wisdom. Finally, please realize that all of us suffer loss from time to time in life. So don't be surprised when it happens and don't become angry when it happens and don't become disappointed or guilty. To lose is part of life. And if we accept this, we will have much less stress uh, when we experience, uh, uh, we experience loss and the grief that comes with it. Okay. Next uh, lesson that we're going to uh, talk about uh, is uh, the stress that comes from burnout. Uh, remember I said burnout is when the stress level is in the overstress you know, area for too long. And when we're in the overstress area for too long, that will lead us to burnout. So we're gonna be talking about that in our, in our next lesson. So I hope that you'll be with us for that particular session. Thank you and God bless you.